Y'all give it up for them one more time right there, because as Ephesians 5, 19 says, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music from your heart to the Lord. And if you want to know that verse is in the Bible and you want to tell me this worship band isn't anointed, I'll tell you, you have bumped your head. Because I've been places they weren't. If you got your Bibles, if you want to open just a few scriptures, we'll go through tonight. We'll start uh, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. And it says, And let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works, not staying away from our worship meetings as some habitually do, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you. Father, we thank you. Father, I just ask today as I stand up here before this church family that, Father, you let these words be of you, not of me. Father, if one of these words gets in the way, we know we're all in trouble. Father, just fill me with your spirit. And let this message land on the hearts of where they need to be because there's so many different ways it can be taken. We love you. We thank you for all you do, especially the rain you've given us, and I know there's more on the way. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Well, I got here a while ago, and I had about three pages of notes because I kind of just put things together, scatterbrained as I am through that, and had Molly print it off because we were out of ink, and I got here, and I went back, and I thought, well, I'll go to the certain place, and I'll get this deal hashed out. I'll cross out what I need to crash out. Well, about the time I was getting kind of into it, here comes Knox and Clay. So what I was going to talk about is here, but I'm going to talk about what we talked about. It's going to be hogs, wild hogs, shooting them, AR-15s, deer, who caught the most rabbits. It was pretty wild in there a while ago. So that was definitely the relief I needed in there. Not that I was extra, extra nervous, but I knew the Lord had this, but. So I'll say a few things to start out here that'll probably, those of y'all that have got to know me fairly well or know me at all, that'll kind of probably blow your mind. You see, most of my life, most of y'all know this, not be surprised, I've paid my bills in a business that's very relational. It's very relational. You know, most of you know I raised show pigs, we raised goats for 20 years and did that. Well, it's just not the livestock that we sell. You know, they don't just come by them and leave. We don't just take them to a sale. It's so relational because I help these kids. I help these kids all the way through their process. I go to the shows like Houston where there's tons and tons of people everywhere. That's not the shocking part. The shocking part's going to tell you that most of my life, I'm going to tell you, I didn't like people. I didn't want to be around people. They got on my nerves. Some of them still do, but that's just part of it. But I try, and now to be in a place to where I genuinely love people, it's crazy for me to think how I got there. And so as Carter called me Wednesday and we were just visiting, he asked me if I wanted to share and I was like, anything in particular? And he's, you know, kind of said, well, we're going to connect, cultivate and carry on, right? So I kind of put all that together and just started making notes and thinking about some things. And see, I spent my life alone for a bunch of it. I lived on a ranch southeast of San Angelo, just me and the livestock and a couple good dogs. And I'm still convinced that if those dogs that the Lord blessed me with could have talked to people, sold those coats, and gone to the shows, I'd still be southeast of Angelo because they were better than any hired hand I ever had for sure. Luckily, dogs don't talk, and y'all get to hear me talk tonight. So they couldn't talk. What happens when you're alone most of the time? There's no accountability, right? I mean, you do what you want to do, when you want to do it, and when you want to do it. Remember the time my dad come and stayed with me for a couple weeks and ended up being about three months while he was working on a job, and we'll talk about, never mind. Uh, anyway, I, uh, he'd get on to me, son, 9 o'clock, you ain't getting up. I was like, what's wrong with feeding at 9.30? I mean, 6.30, 9.30, same thing. I was up late, I was in town doing other things, whatever they is. Accountability, little steps like that. You see, I believed at that time. I mean, I believed in God. I believed that Jesus came to this earth and went to the cross to save us from ourselves. I believe that he rose. I believed all those things, but the deal was I thought everything in this world you're supposed to do by yourself because I thought at that time there was a real big arrogance over my life. It had a lot to do with a lot of other things that happened in my life, but mainly that arrogance put me in a spot where, number one, I didn't think anybody was as smart as I was. Number two, I didn't think, hey, you believe? You got a free pass to heaven? No big deal. So there I am alone thinking I'm the smartest guy in my industry, especially the smartest guy I'm around. That's part of, part of the reason people got on my nerves. And I remember at a time I was talking to a buddy of mine and one of the few people I actually liked. And a guy came up there and he said, man, you hang out with that guy? I said, yeah, I do. He said, man, he don't know nothing about this livestock. 
And I turned to him and I said this as positive and as confident as I was right here. I told him, I said, hey, you want to know a little secret? If I only got to talk to people as smart as me about livestock, I'd be real lonely. Well, here's the deal. I was lonely. I was alone. I was living alone. I was doing those things. To be alone in your thoughts and in your actions, that's not a good spot at all. Well, about a month ago or six weeks ago, I was scrolling through Facebook and looking at some stuff and doing some work on there, which part of our job now is Facebook so much, and so I blame that on that. But I saw a quote, and I want to read you this quote, and it says, Solitude is dangerous. It's very addictive. It becomes a habit after you realize how peaceful and calm it is. It's like you don't want to deal with people anymore because they drain your energy. Does that relate? Well, that was from an actor. Jim Carrey said that. We think of Jim Carrey exactly. You're going to laugh. That guy was serious. What hit me right then, all that part of my life until recently, two, three years ago, four years ago, that's what I was doing. I was being an actor, a show goat, pig raising actor. People would come around. I'd pull the mask on. Mine wasn't green. It'd stick to my face and make me do magic things, but I was acting every step of the way. I'd go to those shows for three or four days, whatever it was. I would act. I would act like I love people. I'd act like I like your kid. I'd like the, you know, everything else about it. And I'd go home, and I would crawl back in that shell. I'd crawl back in that hole. Problem was, in my hole, it wasn't just the Bible and living for the Lord. See, I'd developed some habits from over time because of me wanting to be fit in somewhere, in the wrong crowd, doing some things. But when you're by yourself, There's no restriction on your habits. You can do anything you want to do all the time because who's there to stop you, right? So what got me here today is, as I look back, I can see it very clearly. Now, as it was going on, man, you'd have told me that it got me here today. Like I've said before, especially in a room with Kirk at the same place and at the church, you know, it's amazing after where we come from through that. But Proverbs 18.1, it says, One who isolates himself pursues selfish desires. He rebels against all sound judgment. That was me, that actor, doing those things. So what happened? How did I, I mean, I genuinely, I'm standing right today. I care about every one of you, I promise. I'm not acting, I'm not lying right here. I'm up here, it's a bad place to lie, right? Especially on this wood. But, well, there's one of you, I'm not joking. I wasn't plugged in anywhere at all. Like I said, I believed in God. But what really, one of the things that really started working on me was being connected and cultivated by God through God's people outside of church. You see, I had some people that were close enough to me that knew about the drugs. They knew about the going to the bars. They knew about a lot of that stuff. They knew about me flying to Vegas in the middle of the night not telling anybody. They knew a lot of that stuff, and so they would come around. They would say, hey, Bronk, you might want to get some stuff in check. So I was 20. One to 25 years old at the height of my career in that livestock den, we made, I made a lot of money right there. That's not another good thing. Nobody that age should ever make that amount of money because I can promise you it ain't good. And so what I did is I kept putting that mask on. Well, some of them would invite me to church. Well, guess what I'd do? I never had a problem with church. I've always liked church. I'd go to church with them. I'd appease them for a little bit. Oh, yeah, I'm straightening up. I'm doing this. Yeah, man, you're right. I got to get it together. Well, as soon as they felt comfortable to be like not watching over me, I'm back in the ditch right there because nobody's around. Again, I'm on that ranch. I'm I'm doing these things all by myself. So we get into this other part of it. That wasn't enough to pull me back in to really make me do this. Actually, a couple of those guys that would actually drive out there and check on me, I couldn't wait till they left. You know, I thought, man, I got to act like I'm doing this and they're getting on my nerves so bad I can't stand it. You know, and I knew their checks was going to cash when they came back and bought their show goat for their kid. That put me in a place right there. So a lot of my hope in people was based on how big their check was going to be, what they wrote for them goats and things like that. But all this time, this Lord, the Lord was still planting seeds in fertile ground for me. He's sending people to water them. He's doing those things. He's making these connections that are just, I don't see them. I don't have a clue while they're there. I'm in business with a guy. His wife tells me one day, I know the guy, girl you're going to marry. And I said, you don't have a clue who I'm going to marry. I mean, I'm about old enough now. I'm not going to get married. Well, I got introduced to Molly. She stalked me for a little bit after that. We decided to get married. It was, uh, we didn't date very long, but I knew that Molly was the girl I wanted to marry. Okay, so she moved, in, moved down there and we get married. 
And she said, where do you go to church at? Well, I had, there was a church I had been going to some. So we went there. I knew just enough people. She probably thought I was there a lot. You know, it kind of worked out. You know, I go in there. Well, we get married. We're going along in our marriage. We're going to church on Sundays. We're connected. Not very much at all. We're cultivating. main thing we were cultivating was hangovers and reasons to not go to church the next Sunday. We're partying. We're just living the life. Young newlyweds, right? Everything's good. We got a great set of friends at the country club based on around there, and that's not really the place. Nothing against country clubs, but uh, I was there a lot. Played golf a lot. Did those things. We go into church a little more and more. Molly gets pregnant with Maddox. Well, you think, okay, that's perfect. He's got a kid coming. This is what's going to connect him and make him really start loving people and doing things, and it wasn't really that. But we started going to a Sunday school class. And in this class, the leaders of it were two awesome, awesome people. They had adopted a set of twins, and they'd adopted a little girl, and Molly was pregnant. We didn't have family down there at Angelo with us at all. We needed somebody to watch Maddox because we didn't want to just throw her in daycare if we could help it right off the bat. We needed a sitter. Well, Robin, the, lay, the, the mom, she wanted to adopt another kid. Well, the husband wasn't sure if it was just emotion or what the deal was, and so he said, hey, why don't you just watch somebody for a little while, and we'll see how this goes on. Well, that right there ended up starting to be one of the first connections that I could remember that actually made that turn in that life because Ron Terrell was a man that, that I looked up to. He never really outwardly did anything at all. He never vocally told me things I needed to do. He thought I was just a pretty good guy. I mean, he knew me from Sunday school. Next thing I know, I'm not playing in the noon group on Sunday at the country club because I'm going to lunch with church people. We're going out to eat at night with church people. We're doing things with church people. We're in this Sunday school class. Molly start, I mean, Maddox starts going to Awanas there at that church. Molly starts teaching in that church. And I look up, and I start this coming over me. I can tell. I'm like, hey, people ain't bad. Number one, those were church people, not those other people, okay? So that made it a little easier to be around them, be around those like-minded people. But we were connected. Things were starting to cultivate anymore. You know, as I, every time I hear the word cultivate, I can't help but think about farming or anything. So I just think about this big plow being drug over my head and just saying, hey, it's time to get it in check. That was a big part of it. Problem was, I still wanted to do a lot of things alone, a lot of selfish desires, a lot of things still happening. I knew I wanted to be married to Molly. But I honestly, I didn't know how to be married to Molly. I didn't have that example growing up. Three or four divorces in my immediate family. And I didn't, I didn't know that example. All I knew is that I went to a uh, class with her. Um, her uh, youth teacher or uh, youth pastor growing up was the one that married us. We drove up to Rio Vista somewhere one day, and we sat in this little class deal. We went over this book, and we did all this. We went through this. You know, y'all going to church? Oh, yeah, check the box. What about this? You know marriage means this, and I tuned out, and check this box and go there. What did I do again? I just put that mask on for this guy to say it'd be okay to marry him. I went through that deal that day, and I left there, and it still scares me to this point. I walked out of there, and I thought, what a pastor he is. Trick that sucker. He's going to marry us. Walked out of there. We did that deal. We got that. And then, so there we are plugged in at that church. Molly, we go along. Life's getting better. There at that church we were going to in Angelo, they had just hired a guy that did nothing but start life groups, home-based groups. He had done it at lots of big, big churches. He had done things. We got invited, like selected out to be invited to this deal to find out about what it was. We went into that meeting thinking, hey, that'd be good. One more night a week with church people, right? It ain't going to hurt me at all. I left that thing being called. I left that meeting being led to lead a life group. I checked the box. Yeah, we'll lead one, thinking no big deal. We get invited to this other meeting. We go in there, and they throw this book in front of us. Three months. Three months of training on discipleship. Three months of training on how to do all this deal with if somebody wants to commit suicide. Three months of teenage pregnancy. Three months of, I mean, everything under the sun. And I never once wavered. Man, this is different. We get into this life group. We start this thing. There I am leading it. All of a sudden with a group of people, and they, did, they put this thing together by zip code or area, uh, addresses in town. It wasn't like you picked, hey, this is my key group right here. 
and I'll take Tyler, and I'll take him. We didn't choose up and play Red Rover to see who was in this group. You didn't know who it was. Tell me God isn't huge, because we walked in that first night. We didn't know. We knew of two or three of the couples. Didn't know two or three of the couples and, and another young couple that we knew pretty well. That group started to mesh. I started looking up and figuring out. I don't know what's wrong with Bronk, but he cares about people. We've got problems going on in here. He genuinely cares. We're doing this. And I'm not comparing leading that life group to being a pastor by any means because it was on such a small scale. But when people put you in that position and you look up, I'm going to tell you that group of people cultivated me way more than I cultivated them. When you get a call or your wife gets a call or a text because somebody's cutting their self and went to the mall parking lot and it was suicide, that's on you. You have to care about people if you're going to be in that role. I knew that was my chance to split. I could go back to worrying about making money. I could go back to doing whatever else. But I knew at that point because, see, all my life, I'd always felt a little different when I was in church. Always. I've shared this with Carter. I'd be at a funeral somewhere, and somebody would say something or a preacher said something, and I'm thinking, man, he should have said it this way. I'm thinking about seeing things even when I'm walking way off the path, see things on the farm, and I'm like, hey, there's a sermon in that. I point blank asked Carter. I said, man, do people think that way? <laughs> no. No, it's you and your, your pegs. So as we go through there, I talk about these, these seeds being planted, these seeds being watered. But who were planting those seeds? Who was watering those seeds? This is where it becomes key for me, and back to that verse we opened up with, these songs we just sang. You see, the people that were planting those seeds, and especially those that were watering them, they were believers. But they were believers who went to church. They weren't believers that said, hey, I've got my deal with God. I go out in my spot, I do this. It wasn't believers that are living basically alone in their own world. This was believers that were in a church. They didn't just go to church. They were plugged into church. They were the church. We know the church is not the building. We know the church is the family. The church we were going to is pretty big, probably 2,000 people on an average service size. We got to know that pastor pretty well. And there was... Right there, all of a sudden, things in my life starting to happen that aren't supposed to happen for a guy that just wants to live for himself and do those things. And I can promise you, when I was living on that rocky soil, it dang sure wasn't the guys I was running with doing any cultivating or connecting or anything else. They weren't there to help you. And when I decided to kind of fade away, they didn't want to draw me back to go hang out and party. Well, that guy's weird. He's off doing that, doing those things. See, I've always loved church. I mean, I did. always did. I, 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 the reasons I didn't go is I don't know, really. When I was in junior high, we were, I was living with my dad, and we were plugged into a church there, pretty involved in that youth group. And then from that gap until Molly moved to Angelo, that's when I didn't care about people. There was no connecting. There was no cultivating. There was nothing going on that was good until I looked back. There was... I don't know how long that was. I guess I was about 30 when we got married, so 12 years seems like 80. But uh, in that first little bit there that I realized, if you are the church, if you're the believer, that connecting and cultivating has got to happen. It's up to you. If you pass that opportunity to do anything one time, you may be leaving a bronc out in the pasture with him and his border collie. You may be leaving who knows what goes next or how it goes down the road. Tyler, y'all can come up. See, here's the deal, and here's what I believe. I know that you can believe and not be in church. I know that you can believe and live life alone. You can live that life alone without connecting, without cultivating, without doing any of that, but you know what you're not going to do? There's no way. And I hear it all the time. I've got friends all the time, especially in our industry. Well, I believe, and we got this going on. I believe we got that. It's hard to get up and go to church in the morning. It's our only day. You know, all those things right here. And this sounds weird to preach to the Wednesday night crowd on this because y'all are the ones that came twice this week. I mean, we're the freaks. But 
I know that without that good connection, you can't carry on. A couple weeks, a couple times a week, I sit in that pew right there. I hear this awesome worship band. I hear messages from a guy that has done so much to connect my family. He's cultivated in what I feel is his calling on my life to do those things. I've made connections within this church. It's almost a year we've been coming here. Those connections aren't just to have somebody to go eat lunch with. These connections aren't just somebody to know in church. These connections aren't just somebody to know whatever you want to do. You want to go rope, you want to play golf, whatever it is. Those are all important, and we have to do it together. But what I know is these connections are made so a bunch of forgiven sinners can leave the walls of this place right here and spread that gospel and spread that good news everywhere. The other thing I do know is these connections were formed. And I remembered the verse I meant to look up and didn't. But I know these connections were formed. That cross stood there last Sunday and looked at it. And for some reason I could see Jesus hanging on this cross this time. I know that every blow of that hammer that drove them spikes in, every drop of blood that landed on that hill, every lashing he took was so we could come together, we could connect, we could cultivate those others, and we could carry on. There's no other way about it at all. You can't connect by yourself. There's no way. You can connect in the bad ways. They're not going to get you there. That song we sang a while ago says you're never alone because we have a God that loves us, no matter what we're doing. I can promise you in the realm of bad, I'm not as bad as a lot of people were or a lot of anything's around, but in my mind a lot of times for a long time I thought I was. I'm just thankful for those people that connected through the years. I'm thankful for a Facebook message from Kirk about five years ago, six years ago, that I never replied to, by the way. But, or maybe he didn't reply back. I don't remember. But, you know, you never know which connection it is that's going to bring it back. As the music team plays, as these altars are open, I'm telling you, they're here to use. We've all been to churches where it, they weren't open. They're here to open. This is for connections, and cultivating, and carrying on, doing those things. And tonight's the night. There's nobody's promised tomorrow at all. And I think so often there was times of when you're alone, things can happen. There's a lot of times the thoughts of, of suicide because you're by yourself. You can't battle depression alone. You can't do these things alone. Thoughts so deep, thoughts so far that you figure out ways to make them not look like suicide so the people on earth wouldn't think it was a suicide. Just thank God for never letting it happen. Being there the whole time because there was many, many times that I put myself in a position that I didn't think I could get out of it. Altars are open. Y'all come down. There's plenty of people around that will pray for you. I'll pray for you. Carter, pray for you. Kirk's here. Tom's here. There should be praying people in this church right now, especially this one sitting on the front row right here because I can tell you the ultimate connection I made was marrying her because when she connected and she changed jobs into a very Christian environment where they were doing devotionals in the morning, she met who's one of her best friends today that connected with her. She cultivated with her. See, the biggest trick, the biggest thing that happened and the biggest part of this whole plan is that that girl, she used to run in the exact same crowd that we needed away from. Not that they're bad people, but we weren't in the same place. We pray for those people all the time. You tell me it ain't real, and God put somebody like that right in my wife's life, and all of a sudden my wife's getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning praying. Every day, I talked about that at men's breakfast. Man, it's time to step up. There's no way around it. See, I still would get up at 9 and feed if we didn't have them little kids around the house all the time, but it's hard to be a bum laying in bed too late in the day if your wife's in there praying, taking care of you. 